Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to QCon San Francisco. And thank you for taking uh, the time to stop by this um, talk. My name is uh, Tal. Uh, I'm one of the founders and the CTO of a company called OverOps. Where really, our mission is to help companies, other companies deliver reliable software more quickly. A bit about myself, which is going to be the least interesting part of this talk. I've been uh, working in the space, I don't know, going on 18 years now, and especially for the last seven or eight years, focusing heavily on um, areas of research in static, dynamic code analyses, um, performance, optimization with a strong focus on the JVM and the CLR for companies working um, at scale where things like stability and throughput and latency are of the highest importance. And uh, I and we um, blog a lot of overops, uh, blog at overops.com. We post a lot of research on it. And what I want to do today is really two things, uh, which are kind of the same, two facets of that. Really talk about some of the, re share, share some interesting research with you. Um, the first part is actually kind of uh, a bonus. I'm known for talks that are like, Bad or for worse, probably for worse. Uh, for talks that are really, really technical in nature, here I'm actually going to be sharing a lot of some interesting um, information that we've gathered. We've surveyed about, I think, like over a thousand, maybe 1,500 developers and DevOps people, but actually the state of consumer reliability and some research, and we're actually going to be, uh, I think, publishing in a couple of weeks. And it actually has a lot of interesting questions that I think would be interesting for folks in the room to see and kind of compare yourself and see kind of where you are with, with respect to the industry. And that's going to be kind of the first part of the talk. And the second one, we're actually going to see, okay, what can we do about it? And what are some of the things, some strategies that we can put uh, into place and really kind of dive a bit more into bits and bytes. You know, things talk about like the application of anomaly detection and deduplication of events to be able to identify things like regressions and um, issues that may prevent us from delivering software that is reliable on time. So we're going to have a two-part talk and kind of leave. I'm going to try and keep the technical part shorter so we have uh, time for some good Q&A uh, at the end. So if this sounds good to everybody, Let's get going. So first of all, let's begin with this 1,500-person survey that uh, our research team um, has run. It actually has a lot of interesting insights. So let's kind of think each one of you guys can definitely kind of compare yourself to that and see kind of whether or not the questions are surprising to you or they kind of fit right into your wheelhouse. So begin with the state of code reliability. This thing's projecting fine. So first of all, about, you know, 2,000 people or something, it looks like, you know, and most of them, you know, from the U.S., Canada, and then everywhere, and then everywhere else. So most of them, 60% of the people, developers, then we've got ops, so it's primarily audience, which is, you know, 80% really DevOps, and then kind of less than 10% on the QA side, so really kind of also aligns, I think, with the audience that we have here, I would imagine, and you know, from anywhere to mid-size to, uh, to large companies, the bulk of them coming from large enterprise companies, companies who employ more than 1,000 employees, it's kind of, you know, the majority. So just get the sense of the people who answer this, and let's dive into the questions. You know, if you ask people, well, how do they see their infrastructure? You know, is it modern, is it legacy? You actually see that most people nowadays are running, or no, they perceive to be modern infrastructure, which is pretty... Um, Fascinating, that pretty uh, good to see. Then we asked them, how do you classify your organization adoptions of DevOps? Production visibility, automation. People are kind of, you know, are anywhere between in the journey to consider going it. Really the minority of organizations believe themselves to be like true DevOps. Most people are kind of halfway through this journey, which is interesting because we've been talking about this as an industry for like, industry for like a decade or so. Now, Here's the interesting part to me. What tools do you use? And this is interesting because what we see here is kind of a hodgepodge. Everybody essentially uses everything. And we can see that, you know, test automation and log analyses, you know, are still the most dominant ones fall closely, but just like infrastructure network monitoring. So we see that people are pretty and then dashboard. We see people are mostly, you know, using kind of everything, but with a classic bend to it. So you see like, you know, 
APMs are probably, you know, used by like a third of the people versus like logs, you know, more, almost double than that. So this is kind of where people are using. So it'd be interesting to see, you know, again, questions like how do you frequently release code? Weekly, monthly, most people are pretty agile. How do they schedule, you know, the releases of their features? Most people align with sprints. Now, here's a very interesting question. So far, everything's pretty hunky-dory, right? Everybody's using all the tools, everybody's releasing quickly, the infrastructure is, the infrastructure is, 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 is modern, so you know, you would ask them, you know, what percentage of each sprint you actually spent troubleshooting issues in your code, right? This should be like 5%, like barely happens. But apparently, if I look at, you know, some, for some people, it's like all they do, it seems, okay? But the majority of people, you know, spend, I would say, 25 to average this thing over here. I'd get like, you know, 20, 25%. It's like a day a week. So if you're thinking about, you know, a company that, inv that essentially um, employs 100 engineers, which is not a lot, or 1,000 engineers, you've got like 20 engineers. That's all they do all the time, right? Essentially just troubleshooting issues in their code. You can imagine essentially so, and the business ramifications of it, are, I'll leave that to the business people, but just in terms of our ability to focus on the work that we want to do and ship code and, and be productive. So this is, this is something that really, you know, I, think, I can't say took me by surprise because I can live in that sphere. But you can see there's a very, very strong dissonance between, on one hand, the infrastructure, the DevOps, the process, it's all moved forward. But it looks like when you're coming to the actual quality of the code itself, I can't say that this is the result that we want to, this is the results that we want to be um, seeing, nor the work that we want to do. And then when I ask people, who's primarily responsible for you know, overall quality, people say it's really dev and it's really ops and it's both, but it's interesting that nobody says that ops is responsible solely, right? It's interesting. You can see that the developers actually have to take a lot of the accountability and the ownership for this, uh, for code. Now, which is the kind of the pillar question, who do you blame? Apparently, nobody ever blames the ops and the DevOps and the SREs. It really looks like the developer or the entire team that gets, that gets most of the flack. Now, here's another interesting uh, question. How do you characterize the uh, quality of your application? Most people, they say, so it's 50% say it's, most people say it's average, some people say it's low, and some people say that it's awesome. So maybe those are the people who don't have to spend a day a week uh, fixing or troubleshooting uh, their code. But it looks like the most of us uh, mere mortals uh, have to spend our lives working on code bases that are average. Now, here's another interesting question. What is the primary reason errors make it into production in your organization? Why do you, trouble, why do you have to troubleshoot issues, right? You know, if something, if I just write code, I put that into like my unit test, my unit test fails, that's usually not gonna take me a tremendous amount of time to figure out what just happened, right? Because I'm dealing with code that I just wrote, state that I control, environment which I fully understand, right? So, and when we look here, we're saying, we're, we see kind of, um, most people say, they just don't have the resources, the tooling, the people, the knowledge to do so. Other people are just moving too quickly. Maybe because they want to a lot of time because they're being pushed by the business. Because we have these sprints, right? The sprint must come. Essentially, the sprint must come out. Every two to three weeks, we got to ship, uh, which is what we said earlier. People ship their code with the sprint. Good or bad, it's going out. Some people say, you know, that um, it's by purpose. They do maybe production ABs. They want to discover errors in production. Could be. And there's also people say, we just don't know who's responsible for all this stuff. But it looks like tool, lack of tooling and speed are the primary reason why we have to spend a day a week doing this kind of stuff. And um, this is a question that I would ask you kind of in your head. If I had to ask you, those of you who are tasked with working with an application that is serving customers, you know, do you actually know how many errors do you have in your production going from benign to medium to severe every day? Do you know, again, it's not a number, like it's 30 nights, 42, right? Like the meaning of life, et cetera. But can you actually ballpark it? Is it a million? Is it a thousand? Is it 50,000? Do we know? Okay. 
So it looks like most people uh, say that they would, and I think another interesting survey would be actually to take those answers, if we could compare them with what's actually going on in the application and see how good that correlation is. I'm betting on pretty large standard deviations. Um, most people actually say, you know, that the, the amount of error, that their, their life is improving, but actually the bulb, the other half is saying, either staying the same or increasing. So the question is, is it decreasing because visibility is not good, or is it because the code of the quality or the quality of the code is improving? Unknown. Which kind of leads us to the next question. How do you actually know if something is breaking? How do you know if what you have is reliable or not? So, most people, happily enough, say they have automation. Now, again, automation is good-ish. It's good-ish because at least you know about it automatically. The bad news, you put it in production. So, okay, it's better than 54%, which is still the majority of people. We just say, we just kind of, you know, we, we just kind of drop it and we go like this. And we come out of the bunker like a day later or two, essentially, and we see, okay, do we have complaints? Do we have escalations? So, and then a lot of people just manually, and of course, I'm not even talking about like my boss tells me, which is a sad reality. <laughs> okay, you give that email, or we don't know when things go wrong, which I certainly hope these people are not either in healthcare or in finance or in anything that, or any other application or service which I'm consuming as a person, and I hope you are not as well. So, this is, inter so this is also interesting. And then, how do you evaluate, again, the effectiveness of your team? You know, productivity, service, uptime, direct by slip. Quality of code seems to be the main thing, right? And that's kind of what we're talking about here. And that's kind of, you know, that's going to be kind of be our segue into the next portion, which you get in a bit. Like, how do we ensure? What are some strategies that we could put in place? What are some of the challenges? And what can we do to improve the reliability uh, of our code? Maybe get half of that day a week uh, back. But you can see that quality of code and productivity are the two core things, and they of course lead to service uptime. But you can see interestingly here enough that um, it's not revenue or it's not customer satisfaction or maybe direct business success, it's quality of code and productivity. Last question, I think so, or either that one the penultimate. What are the top challenges? What's preventing you essentially from getting better? And see if this resonates with you guys as well. This is the other no 1500. There's no formal process, right? We ship code, we test code, but like if I had to ask you, how do you know if the code's reliable? You know, how do you define anomalies in your code? How do you do a regression analysis to know you're going to get a very lukewarm answer from what I've seen? And you guys kind of ask yourself the question, see if you've got a tight answer. See, dev, ops, lacking visibility, processes are inefficient. Okay, so unfortunately, it's interesting that we're not seeing here, we don't have budget. Like, you know, it's not a priority for us. You know, it's interesting that we don't see that. We actually see that there's lack of technology or process, which kind of leads us to the next portion of the talk, okay? So usually, as I said, usually most of my talks that I give are painfully uh, um, technical, but this is a data set that we're releasing as part of our, our annual research. We do a lot of these blog posts, and I just want to preview this. So this is not still out yet, and we're still collecting answers and stuff, but I thought this was just too good not to share with folks who made it all the way here to um, sunny San Francisco. So let's talk really about continuous reliability. What, are that, what does that mean, right? We all, know, we all know what continuous integration is. We all know what continuous deployment and continuous delivery is. Question is, right, we're pushing all this code out quickly. Monthly, weekly, bi-weekly. What is our strategy? So we have this great strategy of, it looks like we have this great strategy of pushing it out there. But then when I ask folks, like, you know, when I ask folks nowadays, how many people deploy manually? How many people go and cop and throw jar files or .NET assemblies or, you know, or JavaScript files onto a folder directly into a server? I very rarely hear that, right? We're in a state where we have a pretty good strategy for integrating deployment. It's always a work in process. But we're seeing when I ask people in the world's largest banks or healthcare companies, what's your strategy to actually knowing that thing is reliable? The answers become much more lukewarm. So let's define, first of all, what is it? Our goal really as developers and DevOps, if I break it down into its two most basic core components is 
we want to identify anomalies and we want to know what the root cause is. At the core of it, when we ship code out, we want to know, okay, what's wrong and why? Right? That's, if, if we know this, usually the fixing part is not the most painful part. We all know this, everybody who owns code, right? If you know what the issue is exactly, you're looking, you have a breakpoint, you're looking at the variable, you know exactly the race condition, you know exactly which thread was racing what, which other thread, life is pretty good. Right? The question at that point in time, you refactor, you change, you change something, challenges, how do you get there? How do you get to, the, to a process where you know about it and you control your destiny with respect to knowing about it versus your boss telling you and you're able to reproduce it. So let's first of all define these two things, right? I said, what's, no, knowing when something's wrong, like identifying an anomaly and then knowing what's causing it. Usually I've done a bunch of talks on root cause analyses. I'm actually gonna talk about anomaly detection this time around in CR. So every talk I give, I usually kind of like to focus on some other part. Root cause analyses is usually, for us as developers and DevOps, we just need to understand what was the code doing, exactly what information it was processing, exactly what was the state of the environment, right? Find out it was running on this box, this is what was happening, this is the volume of request, this is what my code was doing. If I have that, usually I'm ahead of the game, right? So, but the question is then, what is an anomaly? Okay, so I have a geo ticket, right, you know, that I'm focusing on. So anomaly has been identified. How do you define? Because until we are actually able to define, and we all talk about normal detection, machine learning, all that stuff, and until we're actually able to define this and the context continues reliability, we can't leverage. We can't say, okay, if it's a normally have a promotion gate, have a bulldog, angry bulldog preventing that code, that code from progressing forward. Right? We can't really put automation in place to tell us if a code is reliable. So when you look at this, okay, in testing, right, we have test and prod. In test, right, the main vehicle that we use to identify anomalies, right, is whether the test fails. That's awesome because we, the code's not in production, nobody's impacted, we've automated, all good. Challenges are really um, two. A, coverage. If you didn't write the test, or you didn't script this, you know, or your, your, your test automating your Selenium script, or you didn't write your testing, it's not getting tested unless you're relying on actual human, no, human testers, and they're still, they didn't click it, it's not gonna be tested. Second thing, which is even harder, or equally as hard, you're dependent on a fixed state, right? You have to predict, you're the one sending data into your code. It's not real users for the most part, it's fixed. So if somebody else, if, if a publisher, if you're an ad tech company or a customer, is punching in something that's incorrect, you won't see that in testing, which leads to production, which is detection is usually done via two things, either uh, escalation, right, or impact, which are both, meaning, uh, or alerting, let's say first, or let's say, you know, alerting or impact. Alerting means you saw it, okay? Impact means somebody else saw it, right? So we all have metrics, we all look at key health metrics, we see if the amount of inbound requests is below a certain threshold, right? We, we see, we, we have these KPIs that we look at. Now, and the system that we're looking for is a business metric is down, code is slower, somebody's complaining. The challenges are the stories of our lives. When these anomalies take place, right, it's unplanned. We didn't plan for it. It happens on a lazy Thursday afternoon. So it's after the fact, and we're relying on our users, either people who work at our company or others, to um, detect those issues for us, right? So... That's not very good. We need something, we need a better way to define, identify, and then get to the ability to um, do anomalies. The question becomes that of data, right? When we looked at what most, what's the data, what's the data say? The most, the bulk of the people use to analyze and to verify their code, it's usually primarily when talking organizations, log data, right? The question is, even if I, and this is a question I, go, I ask most, you know, I ask so many firms that we work with. Even assuming that all the answers to your questions, okay, whatever those questions are, were in your log files, how do you know them? How would you get to them? How would you know what to search for, right? So we propose, I usually propose this, it's a thought experiment, okay? Three kinds of anomalies to look for, 
and then we're going to do some code, and we're going to do some technical things, which is, you know, understanding, first of all, when a new issue is introduced. Ask yourself, how good is your ability to know when you actually introduce a new error into your code? How good are you being able to spot that in high-level environments in production, right, without somebody telling you about it or some impact than ha you having to look for it? Second thing, which is even harder, how do you do regression? How do you actually know that this thing in a previous release used to happen 15%, now it's happening 40%? How can you actually gather data to tell how many times is this happening and out of, and out of how many calls? Right? And the second goes also, not just how many times this is, this, something's happening, a law, an error in your code, a, a timeout, a race condition. How do you use this data to actually figure out if something is slowing down? Right? And a key issue that we have is something, things slow down over time. We don't go from like, it used to take a second, now it's taking 20. It decays slowly, release after release in the environment. So the question is, if we define these three as anomalies, right, if these are things that, ideally speaking, we would like to have a report after every release that uh, gives us this data, and then we can say, okay, if I have more than X amount of these, I don't promote the code. Or if it's in production, I pull it back. Or at least I know what to fix. Right? The challenges in doing that, what's preventing uh, us from doing that is threefold. First of all, how do we deduplicate the data? If I give you guys right now all your system's log files from the last month, and let's say you have 50 million or 100 million lines in that, how do we actually turn that into something you can run any form of regression analysis on? Versus just, you know, you reading it and tagging it manually. How do you actually take that data, right? Or you, maybe you can write 200 different, like, search queries through it. But assuming that you're like most of us, how do you do that? And let me even say, okay, even if I took 100 million lines of log files and tell you, you know what? There's actually 100 issues that's causing this, okay? Like, you actually have 100 issues in your code that's, that spring out these 100 million events. How do you classify them, right? How do you know which one's new, which one you know, how is it handled by the code? It's error or warning, maybe. It, you know, if it's an error and exception, is it, how is it being handled, right? Is it a slowdown? Is it important? When was it introduced? Right? We lack that data to actually be able to have, you know, we lack those capabilities all the time. And the last thing, all right, I give you that data set. Okay, you get a report with a thousand issues and I've punched in all the numbers. How do you then know to apply thresholds that are not noisy? Meaning, you're not just saying, okay, I can ask you somebody, look, how many, socket, how many network errors do you have in your system every day? Let's look at the log files. You know, I don't know. Yesterday we had 10,000. Today we have 11,000. Tomorrow we have 9,000. Good, bad, regression, right? It's never about just the number of or timeouts. Forget that, you know, this thing is timing out 500 times a day. Good, bad. Everything must be relevant to throughput. Right? It's only in percentages that I can say, okay, you know, I'm, there's some things I'm willing to accept you know, on, uh, on Cyber Monday where I know I'm going to have a lot more failures that I'm not willing to accept on a normal Tuesday afternoon in my production system, right? which also leads to the question of seasonality. What is allowed when? So th this is a tall task, right? How do we take the data in our systems, we deduplicate it, we classify it, and we apply smart dynamic thresholds. I mean, th threshold that relate to throughput, uh, threshold to take into account seasonality. So at the end of the day, we can get a report which tells us exactly um, this release. This is, what, this is what I think about it, okay? It's got two regressions, two new issues, this is important, this is not important, this is minor, we proceed, okay? Proceed as in take it to production, or proceed as if it's production A, B, we move it to the entire cluster, right? Those are the challenges. In most companies, it's, it's hard to do that. So let's talk a bit about some strategies, okay, that we can put in place. 
It's a combination of another talk that I gave and some new things that we just released uh, from our research size that are open source. I'm going to show you some of those links so you can play with them with yourself, uh, yourself and just give them, a th give them a good think. Let's talk about the approach. What do we need to do? Okay. Assuming this is interesting to us. Okay. Assuming, you know what, Sal? If I had that report, every time I ship new code, I could go back and I can look at it. I can see I, want, I like it, I don't like it. That would be neat. You know, I'm down with you to kind of, you know, go on this journey. The question then, okay, what do we do? The main thing is that by the, t the, the main challenge is that by the time data hits our log files, it's almost too late for two reasons. Um, one, it's very hard to go from text back into data that you can operate and apply machine learning and nominal detection to. Because you're dealing with unstructured text, meaning when the code is executing, it has full context as to where it is in the code, what call stack it's coming from, what release it's running, what was the state, right? Once you emit, you take an exception, you take an error, you take a timeout, okay? And you say log.info, log.error, log.warning, and you emit that out, you've now moved to a world of text. Reverse engineering that text back into structured data, structured analytics is very, very hard. So ideally speaking, we want to be there in real time so we can kind of be control our own data. Or at minimum, we want to enrich our logs with data that enables us to then go back and convert that back into analytics. So there are four things we need to have in, able, in order for us to kind of create that magic report that we're looking for from every event that's happening in our code. First of all, we need to have context as to where is that thing coming from in a structured way. Remember, if you can read it with your eyes because you know the log statement, that's great, right? But it doesn't allow us to automatically create a regression report from it, assuming you're not going to be the person reading each log line and say, oh, I know this, this is here, and I, I know that, this comes from that, right? We need something that can enable us to automatically classify, classify things and duplicate them. So first of all, we need to know the entry point to the code. Where is it being called from? What servlet, what future, what actor, regardless of you know the framework that you use, what line in my code began this, uh, began this journey, right, into the code? Whatever it is, if, if this is a timeout, if this is a network error, if this is a null point exception, I mean, if taking like a programmer defect. So that's one thing. The best strategy to do that, I'm gonna put you some, is essentially what you wanna do is Load that. Whenever you, whenever you enter into an execution context within your code, it is critical that you load that up into a thread local variable that will accompany the execution of that code across the stack. Just use any standard Java thread local state. Make sure that essentially when you're intercepting a servlet, you just put the class name of that servlet into a TLS. So whenever that code is executing, you know where you came from without having to go and ask the JVM or the CLR for a full-blown call stack because that's crazy expensive and you don't have in production the performance budget to do that. The second thing is you need to know the call site. Where did it time out? Where did it log? Where did it uh, throw that exception? Again, you might know this by looking at the log and saying, oh, it's, it's, you, can't you see it's this word here that tells it, right? Doesn't matter. We need it in a consistent manner that we can pull that data, that we can pull that data and map reduce it. So it needs to be structured. Third thing, I'm going to show you how, kind of how that looks like. Third thing we want to do is um, we, want to know the, we want to know the type. What is it? Okay, again, not just by looking at reading the text. So error warning. So first of all, things like severity level in the logs, that's easy. But if it's an exception or a timeout or a slowdown, we need to know what it is. That's uh, the third thing. And the fourth thing, what release was the code running? Okay, to be able to, I need to be able to look at a line of log, okay, and say, this was running this release. The way, uh, sorry, I'm moving the other way, right? This concept, integrating these four things is what we call, is, is what we call within our research event identity, okay? Essentially, it's a function that says, okay, you know, it's got these four variables into it, meaning it, it, for every line in the code, I can create an identity, a unique identity, which is the release. Now, you can have a more detailed identity, which does, all right, it's not enough for me to just know these four things. I also need to know this, this or I need to know uh, some microservice that I was running or the folk. Great. 
Identi an identity function can be as complex as you want it to, but then there's cost of managing it, producing it, because you need to be consistent everywhere in the code. These are the four things which we've seen with our research to be the most ROI, uh, you know, have the highest ROI. I mean, these four things, without these, it's very hard to produce any meaningful conclusions. Once you have that, what you do, you hash it, okay? Once you have an event identity, I've got these four variables, I have a consistent hash that's very fast, okay? For me to produce, like a git sha, you know how for every, you know, for every branch, for every, we have like a sha, we have something that identifies it, right? And we have this number, uniquely identifies it, a branch, a diff within our code. We want every event in our code, every log error, warning, timeout, slowdown, uncaught acceptance, slow, whatever an event that you want to track, and you want to be able to see whether or not it's regressed or is new, you need to have an event identity for that. Now, I want to share the report. There's a previous talk that I gave every, uh, at QCon, I think it was uh, I think last year or the year before that, which actually tells you exactly, there's code on GitHub, and there's, I'll be posting a link to this. So there's both a code in GitHub and that talk recorded. It shows you exactly how to instrument your code to, do, to achieve these things. But what I want to do, okay, is I want to take this, to, because I can't like give every year, I can't give last year's talk, it's not interesting. I want to actually take it to the next level and see, assuming we have this data, assuming we run this thing, okay, we actually have an event identity. All right, neat, how? I worked on this really hard, okay? I, did a, I, I built this by myself. Every time my code gets called into, I load that into a TLS. I know exactly where to load in memory the release that I was running. I've written a, a, a simple log appender or some bytecode weaving, okay, that tells me exactly the method in the code that's logging this event. And I also have a good, and I, I, if it's an exception, I caught it and I classified it as what, what it is, et cetera. I've done all this work, put it into a hashing function, oh, great, okay? What then? What do I do with this thing, okay? Which kind of leads us to the next thing, like how do I get to this? Okay, the font here is gonna, uh, so I don't know if, if I'm gonna try and zoom and see what it does. No, Chrome doesn't like to zoom. All right, I don't know. So essentially, it's, it's the ability to see after every release, right, how many issues, when was this release first seen, how many issues were introduced, which ones are new, and if it's a regression, tell me exactly, you know, um, how many times it's happened out of how many calls into the code and what, is the, and, and what is the delta? So what we've done, okay, we published a set of algorithms that can be consumed uh, through open source and even through a Jenkins plugin, it's open source research, that you can actually consume and the links will be uh, at the bottom, okay? But I wanna show you some of them now. So all the links are here for both the code, okay? For both the code and the regression analyses, right? So take a look at them, but let, let's see this kind of, let's use kind of our last, you know, our remaining minutes here um, to actually do some uh, live work together. So I've packaged this code as um, a, an open source Jenkins plugin, right? And essentially what this plugin gets, receives, is kind of this, these are the parameters. This is one of the things that I've, we've looked at through our research is how do we create an algorithm which has really the two, the three key, prior, three key kind of metrics or values to it. A, Given that I've done this, given that I've, I've deduplicated my data, I've created this event identity you know, with your open source stuff or I built it myself, or I use a commercial tool, whatever, okay? It's easy for me to get that into that thing, right? So it's like, that's one thing. The second, okay, uh, is that it's, um, so the second thing is that it's easy for me to tweak it, control it, right, on one hand, so you don't have to give me like 500 switches, yeah. You can apply um, some crazy Stanford-like machine learning algorithms to it, but like how many people in the company will actually know how to use this? The third thing, it needs to be non-noisy. I mean, it needs to be really, really good, really, really deterministic at what it looks, what it looks at as a regression. So these are, this is a baseline, okay? this is all open, so you can fork it, you can play with it, but this is a suggestion, we've had a lot of success with this, with customers, okay? Uh, and that's why we open sourced it, which is for a specific deployment, okay? Let's compare that to a baseline. One of the core tenets of every form of machine learning that you have is comparing something to something, 
right? When we look at AI, when we look at like you know, self-driving, all these things, it's about creating some form of baseline data the system learns from, and then it can apply. Then you can create some conclusions about you know, a specific thing that it's looking at. So you gotta have a baseline. So you look at a month. What you do, essentially, you, you, essentially, you can look at the month, and then you say something like this. If an event, if the first time I've seen the, this event, if this event was introduced in this release, I mean, the first time, well, what do I do? If I have a database, if I have a table of all the event identities, and I can see this is the first time I saw this event identity, I mean, it was introduced. By, by assigning unique event identity to everything that's going on in your system and tracking that in any time series database and a log analyzer, it's very easy to see when it was first introduced. That's the power of it. Think about if you could look at every error, every event in your system, say, yeah, this has been happening for two years, not interesting. Ooh, this actually, uh, this, is, this has never been detected, you know, up until yesterday when you deployed that release, right? And then, if this issue happened more than 10% of the time and more than 50% uh, in absolute uh, terms, you can say, okay, this is important. This, from my standpoint, okay, requires me to either stop the build or have somebody look at it. Or you can say things like, if it's any one of these specific known air types, like what's your tolerance for a new knob pointer, right? Very low. For example, your tolerance for a socket exception depends. For example, if I load up a release and I see, yeah, this socket exception is new, but it's happened too many times, no longer happening, I'm probably cool with it, right? If it's blasting through the logs right now, like socket exception, socket exception, socket exception, right? And it's happening 20% of the calls, we probably have to take action. So it's the ability to say if something is new, okay, you know, set up some minimum volumes, volumes for it. But these are values that are very easy to set up. Just saying like, you know, more than 500, more 10% of the time, block, right? Second thing, and this is where we go to regression. Okay, that's new because it's a new signature. But what if I have a signature on existing ones? How do I detect, essentially, you know, if something has regressed? We say, okay, we look within this current, within the active time window. This is happening 5% of the time. If this thing more than doubled, it's called a regression. Sorry, it's, it's happening more than 50% of the time, it's called a regression. If it's more than double, okay, we call it a severe regression. If it's, if it's happening twice now more than it used to, it probably merits us either stopping you know, the version from promoting or looking at it. The last thing is applying, seasonal, uh, is applying seasonality. That's a core thing that you need to do. I'm going to show you, kind of, we're going to run through some code in a second to kind of take a look at that, kind of put this into uh, practice. Seasonality is a core tenant because you may have a spike. Let's say, for example, I look at the past week. Let's say it's Monday, I'm seeing a crazy spike in some form of error in our system, right? If I say, okay, it's happening 10% of the time today. If this thing happens once a week, every Monday, this surge happens where our system is ingesting a huge amount of data, right? If I just say, okay, it happens 1,000 times today out of a million calls, okay, or out of 100,000 calls, it's 1%, or whatever, whatever the statistic is. If I just look back and compare that rate to last week, last week, while it was seven days, it happened once, it spiked once during that time. But if I look at the overall time period, right, I, divide, I have to divide by seven days. So it's on the relative rate, if it's happening 10% of the time today, last week it happened, you know, 10 divided by seven, 1.3% of the time, right? You guys follow me? If I just say there's a time window, it only happens on Mondays, and then it blasts. If I just compare that to the overall throughput of last week as a whole, I'm going to balance, I'm going to smear that peanut butter equally. It's going to look like a crazy regression, right? But it's noise. So seasonality is the concept. Every algorithm you have must take into account that you look, you must compare each time window. So you take Monday, and you take time window versus time window versus time window. And then you can say, if I saw a time window last week that had a similar spike, or two spikes that have 50% volume, or three spikes that have, let's say, 33% volume, then one can say, okay, then in this case, we, indeed, it's a seasonal thing, right? And the nice thing about it, the longer your baseline is, the more likely you are. To, uh, detect, uh, to detect things. Think, of it, think about something that only happens on tax day or happens quarterly, right? 
if you have a baseline of a year how the system runs, you're almost, I don't know, you're, you're, uh, you're, you're how, I don't want to say you're strong as God, I don't want to say you're as powerful as God Almighty when it comes to continuous reliability, but you have a really, really good baseline to work with. So this algorithm here, okay, is something that's released. All the API specification of like the kind of data that's supposed to be, now this is like, this is by the way what a deduplication an event ID looks like. You know, this is just the type, when was first in introduced by that event ID. So the, the algorithm says you've, uh, you've deduplicated the data, okay, based on the other open source code in the other talk that's linked to here. Okay, you have this risk data coming in, and for each one of those, I can pull in a set of points. Wait, what you've done, and how do you t obtain those points? You either instrument your code, the code is in the, that other GitHub project, to every, t every event identity, send that as a metric out, or just write it into your Splunk. Every time you log an error message, if you have that function that creates that, that event identity in real time, log it, right? Just say ID, event ID, EID, equals that value. Then it's really easy to pull that with a Splunk or Elasticsearch query and get that report. Once you have that event ID in the fabric of your log data, deduplicating it to getting metrics become very, very easy to do, right? So, that's, so once you have that, if you can convert that into simple REST format, then you can take this algorithm. You can see that kind of, you can see that play out. So I have a live breakpoint here, for example, where we're, analyze, where we're analyzing the data. And it's interesting to see. I can put like, you know, I can put it here. This, this breakpoint, by the way, is just me running this report, just running this job in Jenkins. So essentially, I have a Jenkins plugin that's essentially look, taking these parameters, looking at a specific release in my database, pulling it from my influx database, from my log analytics, okay, uh, pulling that data and operating on it. I'm doing it here in the context of Jenkins, meaning I have a release candidate. We've run four hours of tests on that, okay? Before we want ahead, before we go ahead and move that up to production, I want to be able to get that report, and if I see anything I consider severe, mark the build as unstable. I want to have a proactive gate that automatically prevents something from moving upwards. It doesn't even have to go into production. Maybe I don't want even go, I don't want it going to UAT, right? I don't want to spend, I don't want to send something that's broken for tests by our internal users. So we're here right now, and you can see in the code, it's actually pretty straightforward. You take the code and you say, you normalize it. So you see every event, you normalize volume versus you know, how many times it, it, it gets called into it. And then you're saying, okay, take, let me get the tooltip out. What's the rate of percentage between the baseline time? Like this happened, you know, this, is, this used to happen, you know, um, you know this, is the, this is the ratio. If I, where's my break point? Boink. Okay, so if I step here, dun, 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 let's load up the variables, right? For this specific event, you know, this specific log warning and redistribution map, right? Because the nice thing is, once I have that event ID, I also save it, right? I have a database with all my event IDs, so I can go back. So I can say, okay, this event ID is a log warning and the Redis redistribution map get all present, right? This is a cache thing, right? This is Redis. Like, um, I need to know that this, that our calls into our cache have not significantly um, regressed. So, I can do, I can essentially come here, I can see I can kind of, and I'm checking the delta, like how often did it happen previously, you know, and then what I do here, okay, you can see this code, it's not deeming it as a regression, and I'll tell you why. Because this thing here, okay, the delta between them, it's reducing any delta in the throughput. Let me explain what that means, okay? It means, it doesn't, it, even if something happens more than 10 times, okay, uh, than 10, you know, this is happening 50% more. I all, I, dis, I, 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 I um, subtract from that any changes in volume. Meaning, if the code, let me ask you this. If something used to fail, you know, a thousand times out of 2,000 calls, and now it's failing 2,000 times out of 4,000 calls, because we've increased the load, we've increased the volume, is that a regression? No, because essentially it's still happening 50% of the time. So actually, by reducing that, you clear a lot of the noise. And then, let's wait for something that is, you know, uh, does pass that test. If I run this here, 
The second thing that you do, I'm going to reduce the, get this breakpoint along here. This actually did pass that test. But then you can see that the algorithm, what does it calculate seasonality, right? And what it does, I'm not going to, we don't have time to step in because essentially if it sees any volume, see, it didn't see any, re, it, it didn't see any, re, any instance where the seasonality result said, you know, there's more, there's a period, there's a similar period or larger. We found more than one or two periods. So remember Monday, you know, let's say we spiked on, let's say we spiked on Monday, okay? Are we seeing in the baseline any previous Mondays where we saw this spike or any additional time periods where we saw at least 50% of that volume, okay? Uh, again, I'm just throwing all these concepts at you, but this, all this code is open source and just I want to kind of, you know, give you a taste of that. I don't expect anyone to go in right now and, you know, uh, debug this with me. At that point in time, you say that it's a regression. The output of this, and this is what's neat, you get this. I, if I let this thing run, you can actually see in this, you know, 25 new issues, three severe aggressions in V4.25, first thing a month ago, against a baseline of one month, right? So I can actually run this code in Jenkins, and I can see, okay, here are all the issues that are new, that were introduced by this release. Why? Because I've never seen this, this event identity in my database up until, you know, the time when this release began, started running. You can see exactly how many times it's happening, out of how many calls, and again, those, obtaining those metrics, you can look at that open source project that's in the previous call. And then for each one of those, if it's severe regression, okay, I can actually link this to anything that's important. I can actually, you know, in this case, this specific report, I've tied this to, you know, uh, you know uh, I've tied this uh, to our commercial tool, so I can actually go in and see this is how this is how regression looks like, right? Flat, flat, flat. I can see this. It, it used to happen a bit here. This line is not flat, and suddenly, boom, explosion here. And then at that point in time, we've relinked it to the root cause analysis stuff. You can also apply this. In, in that previous talk, we talked a lot about in, in visualizing things, Grafana. So you can actually visualize this the exact same report from your Grafana or from your dashboard. That code will actually, that plugin for Grafana will be made open source. Uh, I believe next month. So, I think we're kind of uh, just about uh, out of time. I threw a lot of stuff at you. We started, like, you know, we started talking. You know, we went started very high level state of the industry, and we finished with like, with, like kind of deep coding and uh, you know algorithmic approaches to contest reliability. But at the end of the day, our goal, right, is how do how can we prevent how can we create automation to know when we do deploy code, when we do ship code out, whether or not we've introduced a new breakage, we've slowed things down, or we've regressed things without having to rely on our users or, God forbid, our boss for telling you about this. So uh, with that, I want to open this up for, uh, first of all, I want to thank you for coming to the talk. And the second of all, I want to see if you guys have any questions about all the stuff that I just thrown at you. I'm going to, I'm perfectly happy to give everybody their afternoon back. We have two more minutes. So any questions around anything? If not, I'll go once, twice, and thrice and give everybody back uh, their afternoon in San Francisco. Questions for anyone? Please, sir. Yeah. No, true. So what you say, no, no. So you, you, you're true. The hash should actually, the hash itself should actually be, uh, you're right, and actually you're absolutely right. The hash itself should be outside of that form. It should be metadata for that specific identity. So the identity should know, should be aware uh, of the hash from which, when it's came up, but it should not be incorporated into the hash. 100% uh, correct. Um, yes? Sure. Sure. So the events essentially are collected as you add it to your code, the ability, if you instrument, you inject event IDs to your code, or you fire them to your time series database, you've said you've created a database, a data set. What Jenkins does, it activates an algorithm which pulls them. It, it makes a call into a REST endpoint. We've built a REST endpoint that knows how to pull that from Infox, Grafana, some commercial tools as well. Um, 
and essentially, uh, at that point, you're analyzing it. So the, the Jenkins essentially just analyzes. Before the code is about to go live, it gives it a score. You can run it periodically. You can say, OK, let's say, for example, I run it every day. I'm seeing, are there any regressions today? It doesn't have to be tied to a specific release. You can say, I'm going to run it today and compare that to a specific, uh, to a specific um, release. So you, can have, you don't have to do it just in the, in the cause of a specific deployment, which really brings us to that gentleman's fine point over there, but not including the hash. Is that clear? Any other que last question before essentially that lady here hits me in the head with the stop sign? Last questions from the uh, audience. Anybody before we give you back your afternoon? Three, two, one. Ladies, gentlemen, thank you so much for the time. Enjoy the rest of your, co your conference.